How much meaning and power does a name hold? Can a chosen name become a curse or a blessing? Or can it even represent a heavy burden of a legacy that needs to be carried forward? I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. Elizabeth I and Elizabeth II are two of the most significant monarchs in British history. But do they share anything else besides their names? Behind the image of a glorious monarch, there was a vulnerable woman, fully aware that her life is in ongoing danger, despite being strong-willed, clever and passionate. Queen Elizabeth was surrounded by opponents, plotting to steal her crown or assassinate her in a period of murder and intrigue. She was aware that she had to rule as both king and queen over a nation in upheaval. Elizabeth II was the longest reigning monarch in British history. A life of supreme service, duty, resilience, and inspiration. She was a queen for all her people. Her life will be remembered for her sense of duty and commitment, of right and wrong, of tolerance and forgiveness, for a pledge fulfilled. Elizabeth I and Elizabeth II, two women linked by name and legacy, given no other option but to rule their country. This is the legacy of the name, Elizabeth. Elizabeth I and Elizabeth II shared a name and a title, but they also had a deep understanding of how precarious their situation was. Two young women sat on the same throne 400 years apart. Both of them unexpectedly ascended the throne, despite being third in the line of succession. Numerous people didn't waste any time in reminding them that their position on the throne has been one they were never destined to occupy. Although centuries have passed, it seemed that everyone was subject to the same constricting expectations for women. Expectations that feel out of place with such authority in a society where men are more valuable heirs to the throne. Elizabeth I and Elizabeth II both understood early on that the prosperity of the monarchy depended on how well it interacted with the general public. Combined, the two Elizabeths served the country for more than 140 years, significantly altered the image of women in positions of power, and, above all, overcame the difficulties faced and maintained the throne steady. Elizabeth I ruled England for 44 years with remarkable stability and prosperity, an era known as the Elizabethan Age. She was known as Virgin Queen, Good Queen Bess and Gloriana during her time in power. The daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, his second wife, Elizabeth I was born in Greenwich on September 7, 1533, becoming the last Tudor monarch. Henry certainly was expecting a son. We know that, in fact, because he prepares the birth announcements for the birth of a prince. Unfortunately for her parents, of course, she is a girl, and the birth announcements are amended to add an S to say princess. She's the first child of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, the first since the break with Rome. Now, some historians have suggested that Henry was furious at Anne for the delivery of a daughter, and indeed that this was the beginning of the end of their relationship. But actually, we have good evidence that Henry consoled Anne and suggested that the delivery of a healthy daughter was a good sign for the sons that would follow. 
Elizabeth's birth was disappointing. I mean, he really did want to have a son, but he knew that both he and Anne were young enough to have more children, and Anne does quickly become pregnant again the following year. Elizabeth's mother Anne is executed when she's two years old, and it is an enormous change for Elizabeth. Her mother's execution must have been the most traumatic event of her childhood and possibly her entire life. She may well not have remembered her mother, but certainly she knew of the circumstances. Her early years were filled with uncertainty, and after the birth of her half-brother Edward in 1537, it appeared that she had very little prospect of inheriting the crown. After her half-sister, Princess Mary, a Catholic, she was therefore third in line. In reality, she was always viewed as illegitimate by Roman Catholics. Elizabeth was a highly intelligent young woman. She was gifted in education. Indeed, she spoke eight different languages. Elizabeth was incredibly intelligent and she spent most of her days as a teenager and young woman at her desk. I mean, it was actually later remarked of her that she would read Greek for fun um, because that was seen as quite strange. Elizabeth also learnt, I think, a great deal through her childhood and adolescence about the politics at court. She learned how to bend, she learned how to stand her ground too. Really was a gifted individual. When it comes to Elizabeth of England, Elizabeth I, I think it's important to try to get as much of a grip on her personality as you can, because it just makes her live a bit more, really, in many ways, and not just be these dusty words in a, in a book. There were some elements of her that were terrifying. She had a, a terrible temper. She swore like a trooper, like a father. In fact, they said she swore like a sailor. But then again, they were quite often linked with blasphemy, like God's breath and this sort of thing. And she's one of Shakespeare's very famous uh, swearings, which was you four inch bed presser. Now, I don't know if Elizabeth said that, but that's the kind of thing that was said there. They tend to be a bit more flowery uh, than we say now, but she had a vile temper and she was under extreme tension. When Elizabeth's half-sister died in November 1558, she ascended to the throne. She received a very solid education and inherited her parents' wit, tenacity and intelligence. After only five years on the throne and having provided no heir, Mary dies in 1558 leaving her throne begrudgingly to her Protestant sister, Elizabeth. Elizabeth is immediately proclaimed queen, and she is told at Hatfield while she is sitting reading under an oak tree. Given the fact that it's November and it's very, very cold, this looks very much like a stage scene, that she is waiting to be told that she is now queen. There was something of a sigh of relief in the country who had been exposed to quite radical measures to return the country back to the Catholic faith. And they hoped that the young Elizabeth would provide more stability, more peace and harmony. Following her accession at Hatfield, Elizabeth makes her way to London. She's met by cheering crowds. She is Henry VIII's daughter. And in fact, her coronation portrait is very much reminiscent of her father. She's displaying herself as Henry VIII's daughter. It was entirely customary for monarchs to be crowned within a couple of months of their ascension to the throne. But Elizabeth was keen to choose the most opportune date in which the crown was to be placed on her head. And therefore she employed the court astrologer, John Dee, to look at her birth map and choose the most opportune date for her ascension. Elizabeth's reign is often seen as one of victory and accomplishment. The Queen was frequently referred to as Gloriana, Fair Queen Bess and the Virgin Queen. She developed this image by purchasing extravagant clothing and jewellery and travelling the nation on regional visits known as progressors, frequently riding a horse rather than a carriage. <laughs> 
Young and beautiful, the new queen never lacked in admirers. Archduke Charles of Austria, Eric XIV of Sweden, Henry, Duke of Anjou and afterwards King of France, Francois, Duke of Alençon, and even her older sister's widower, Philip II of Spain, were among the foreign monarchs and princes from all over Europe who wanted to marry her. Elizabeth, however, had observed Mary's mistake in choosing to wed a foreign ruler. Elizabeth also had numerous English suitors, but she turned them all down. Tudor women had very few rights. They were expected to marry, and they would then become effectively the property of their husband. I think Elizabeth learned a huge amount about the risks that came with marriage from her mother's downfall. Indeed, I think these risks were also compounded when, at only nine years old, the same thing happened again to her stepmother, Catherine Howard. I think Elizabeth learned a huge amount about how vulnerable women were to their husbands, how subservient they had to be. And it's broadly similar for a queen. Although a reigning queen does retain some authority, their husband will become king and will be deferred to and become the dominant party. And we can see this with Mary I, who marries Philip of Spain, and he becomes King of England. We can see this in Scotland, where Mary, Queen of Scots, marries Henry Lord Darnley, and he becomes King Henry of Scots. And Elizabeth was also keenly aware that in order to rule as a woman in your own right, you really had to do so alone. Elizabeth is expected to marry and give England a king. Elizabeth actually receives a deputation from the House of Commons not long after she becomes queen, where they petition her to marry. And she takes it in very good grace, but she says to them, you know, since I've been a child, I have decided that I'm going to remain unmarried, that I'm going to be a virgin. I'm going to reign as a virgin queen. It doesn't really cause any stir, which is surprising, but it really it's because just nobody believed her. I mean, it was a ridiculous suggestion that this young girl of 25 would hope to reign as queen. Of course she had to marry. Of course she had to give England the king. Her role was to produce heirs to continue the dynasty. She swore off marriage and took a vow of celibacy, declaring that she would govern as a virgin queen. She knew that if she had married, her husband would automatically have become a king regnant. And Elizabeth wanted control, not only of her own destiny, but that of her kingdom too. Quite apart from her own inclination not to marry and not to share power, she would also know that actually, it would be impossible to find a candidate that would please everyone. Mary, Queen of Scots, her cousin, had married for love. Mary married James, 4th Earl of Bothwell, in 1567, who many thought had just a few weeks earlier killed her second husband, Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley. Mary was thus compelled, in the middle of a rebellion, to renounce the kingdom. All of this constantly served to remind Elizabeth of the perilous nature of love. Indeed, people already thought that Mary had a more legitimate claim to the English throne. And this really matters to Elizabeth because Elizabeth is still legally illegitimate. So legally, she has no title to the throne other than by act of parliament and by her father's will. When Elizabeth hears that Mary has landed in the north of England, she orders that she be placed under house arrest and Mary remains imprisoned by Elizabeth for 20 years. For years, Elizabeth had conducted her statecraft masterfully and had avoided war, despite rising tensions between France and the rest of Catholic Europe. But still, with invasion threats from Spain through Ireland and France through Scotland, 
Elizabeth's reign was one of great peril and difficulty for many. The English were expecting an invasion from Spain and Philip built a great fleet, the Spanish Armada. So Elizabeth goes to her troops at Tilbury to try and ready her forces. Elizabeth really showed her mettle at a speech that she gave at Tilbury. She talks about having the body of a weak and feeble woman, but having the heart and stomach of a king and a king of England. She really rallies the troops. She portrays herself as a war leader. The Spanish had a much larger fleet and the odds were stacked against the Queen. The English rallied their troops, preparing themselves for invasion. But then the weather broke and the tides turned. Storms formed and winds blew, scattering the Spanish fleet. Her commanders, Lord Howard of Effingham and Francis Drake, are able to scatter the Spanish fleet, partly by aid of a Protestant wind that blows in the English favour. England sent burning fire ships, which scorched and sank the Armada's galleons. The English sailed back to Plymouth, victorious. Then Elizabeth became Gloriana, the Virgin Queen, the semi-divine monarch of myth and magic. It is a triumph of Elizabeth's reign. This is where the mythology of Elizabeth really starts. The truth of the matter is that it was more the weather than uh, anything that Elizabeth had done that was the downfall of the Armada. But this is where Elizabeth, the powerful virgin queen, really comes into prominence. The defeat of the Armada was the high point of Elizabeth's reign. And we know Elizabeth was a great propagandist and she was determined to use this to create capital on a European stage. And one way that she did this is actually through iconography. We've got the Armada portrait, which was commissioned, and it shows Elizabeth in her absolute prime. Elizabeth understood her need to be seen by her people and recognized the role of her image in how she was perceived as a woman and in turn, a sovereign. She cultivated an image of a queen who did not need a king to be seen as capable and powerful. By carefully curating her public image in portraits and propaganda, the Queen presented herself as a timeless ruler. Elizabeth really refined her image over the years. She understood the power of dressing powerfully, of covering herself in jewels, of accentuating her femininity. And I think this is where the myth of the Virgin Queen really comes from. It's not only a statement about the fact that she is ruling in her own right, that she isn't touched by man. She also very much uses her femininity to her advantage in her propaganda, because actually being a woman is a major disadvantage for a ruler in the period. And yet, actually, she is able to use this and to turn it round. Contemporaries talk of being in love with Elizabeth. She's seen as ageless, eternally beautiful. She's the fairy queen. She's Gloriana. And actually, again, we can see this in her portraits because she doesn't age. When we see portraits of Elizabeth, we're seeing Elizabeth through the mirror of propaganda. So her face remains white and unlined and beautiful throughout her reign. It's only paintings painted after her death where we actually start to see the aging queen because any portrait that was unflattering would simply be destroyed. Time stands still for no man or woman. And by the late 1590s, Elizabeth was hurtling towards 70 years old. In March 1603, the queen died at 69. Elizabeth was destined to be the last of her dynasty. And of course she knew this. She had no children. She had no nephews and nieces. There was no one else to carry on the Tudor line. Elizabeth died childless, and at the end of her reign came the end of the Tudor dynasty. Although she's not the first English reigning queen or the first reigning queen in the island of Britain, she was undoubtedly the woman that proved that women could reign in England. She reigned for over 40 years and she reigned independently. She didn't have a king and she was very much in control of her kingdom. And I think that's her greatest legacy, really. It is her, 
contribution to English queenship, all subsequent reigning queens have to some extent modelled themselves on Elizabeth. We see this with Queen Anne in the 18th century, for example, who, when she becomes queen, she actually takes as her motto, semper idem, always the same. And this was the motto of Elizabeth I. And so this is her legacy. She is the first truly great reigning queen on the island of Britain. Actually, I think one of Elizabeth's greatest legacies was demonstrating that a queen could rule in her own right without a man. She was a queen who did not need a king. Queen Elizabeth II, the cornerstone of modern British history. Reigning monarch for over six decades, she had seen the world change drastically during her time as queen. Her inscrutable commitment to duty, above all else, had defined her lifetime of service to the throne. When the queen was crowned as a young woman, she was very, very shy. She wasn't a great conversationalist. In fact, she didn't really have the necessary attributes to enter this you know, world of men, but she had this extraordinary dedication to duty, which she'd had, actually, it's almost seemed that she'd been born with. On April the 21st, 1926, the future Queen was born. Elizabeth Alexandra Mary. Her father, the Duke of York, later King George VI, was second son of the King. Princess Elizabeth had a very, very happy childhood. She was born in 1926 in the centre of London, in Bruton Street, and it was six weeks before the general strike, so it was a time of great political turbulence. But there was still great excitement about this new royal baby. During her grandfather's reign, Elizabeth was third in line of succession to the British throne, behind her uncle Edward and her father. Although her birth generated public interest, she was not expected to become a queen as Edward was still young and likely to marry and have children of his own, who would precede Elizabeth in the line of succession. Elizabeth knew her role in life. She had to marry and have children, then one day become queen. She and Margaret met Prince Philip when they were very young. Elizabeth was only 13 years old and Philip was five years her senior. Princess Elizabeth met Prince Philip at a family wedding, but she can't really remember that moment. The reason that we know so much about it is because her governess, Marion Crawford, uh, talks in great detail about their first meeting at Dartmouth College, where Prince Philip was a, a naval cadet. And he was very, very good looking, 18 years old, very striking, blonde looking and he was assigned to look after the two princesses, Elizabeth and Margaret, for the day, for their visit, while their parents went around the college. It's quite strange to think of an 18-year-old looking after the princesses, the oldest of whom was 13. Later, he went on board the vessel that the, 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 the king and queen had come to Dartmouth in, and he had lunch, and then, and then the following day, he went and had tea. So that was the meeting that the princess remembers. In 1947, two years after World War II, Elizabeth and Philip married. It was a very grand affair and lifted the nation's spirits in the post-war austerity. From Prince Philip's perspective, this is someone that had had to leave their country. They didn't have a home of their own. All his sisters were married to German aristocracy and lived in enormous castles. And there's Philip 
you know, living off the goodwill of his relations. So I think that the idea of, of marrying a princess that, that was going to inherit so much must have been very attractive. And he was pushed by his uncle, Louis Mountbatten, who was the great kingmaker. Her Royal Highness is the proud and happy mother of a prince. The salute is fired, and in the monarch's home lies the infant boy who will one day be king. On Saturday, the eminent gynaecologist Sir William Gilliatt was called to the palace for the most responsible case in even his career. By his advice, Sister H.M. Rowe was chosen midwife. The whole country knew that the baby would soon be born. All day on Sunday, people waited outside the palace, including phlegmatic pressmen, with whom it is a point of honor to show no excitement. And all day there was no announcement. It was after 10 at night that those who waited, and they were very many, heard the tremendous news, a royal baby and a boy. When their uncle, David, as he was known to the family, otherwise King Edward VIII, abdicated, it was Princess Elizabeth who told Princess Margaret, and she said, Uncle David's going away and Papa is to be king. And Princess Margaret said to her, does that mean you're going to be queen? And Elizabeth said, yes, one day. And nothing more was ever said about it or between them. And Princess Elizabeth, as, as we know very well, um, is able to compartmentalize aspects of her life. Um, so she realized, this girl of 10, that one day, she would become queen, but she tucked that away and she carried on being a normal, natural 10-year-old. I mean, things did change for Princess Elizabeth as heiress presumptive because it was felt that on an educational level that she needed higher education, particularly when you think of uh, the British Constitution and matters like that that it was now crucial that she should be very well aware of. And so she was given this additional um, instruction by the then provost of Eton College, Sir Henry Martin. What happened was the Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip were standing in for the King and Queen and they started a big Commonwealth tour in, in Kenya, as it was called in those days. And the people of Kenya wanted them to be there and they'd given them a lodge for their wedding present. And the, the sort of joy for them was that they were going to visit this game reserve and there was a, a little place called Treetops, which was overlooking a salt lake, lake. So you could really see the animals. You know, this is, this is uh, 1952, so the whole of, of Kenya was teeming with game. And they spent the night up there. And actually, it was during the night, unbeknownst to the princess, that she became queen. So they went, they, they left their, their game viewing, went back to Sagana Lodge, and had, had a little sleep because they'd been up all night. When the news came across to Prince Philip's uh, private secretary, Mike Parker, that the king had died, and he thought that he, he, he eventually had, he had one of those little radios and he fiddled with it, and eventually he heard the sounds of Big Ben and he knew that the news was true. And it was his duty to tell Prince Philip which was probably, he says, later the most difficult thing he'd ever had to do in his life. So he went to Prince Philip and told him the news that his wife, Prince Philip's wife, was queen. So Prince Philip was in such shock, he just put a newspaper over his face and let the news just absorb. And then he got up and he went and got the princess out of her bedroom where she was resting and took her down to the lake at the bottom of the garden. And the lady in waiting tells a wonderful story. She watched them walk up and down, up and down. And she knew that he was telling her 
And when they walked back into the lodge, she wanted, she was putting her arms around the princess and she thought, my goodness, but she's queen and dropped into a curtsy. And then, of course, they had to make their way back to England as quickly as possible. But, she, but by the time they arrived back at London Airport, uh, she came down the steps, beautifully dressed in her black clothes. And Prince Philip waited on the steps until she was at the bottom and she greeted her prime minister. And that's how it was going to be from then on. Princess Elizabeth be became queen in February 1952, and the coronation was in June 1953. But there was no plan for her coronation. It, there had been a plan for her uncle's coronation, Edward VIII, but that had been scuppered. So it, it takes a long time to pull all the ends together. So it was decided that they would wait and until June the following year, and then everything could be lined up, because for a coronation, you've got to have all the heads of state from all the various countries, all the Commonwealth. So you couldn't just say, well, we're going to have it in November. Everybody needed time to organize things. Well, when, when the Queen came to the throne, she was only 26. And Churchill made the remark to his private secretary, that, but she's a child. But she wasn't a child. She was very sophisticated and mature mentally. And it was a man's world. And, in, you know, women were really subservient in those days. And the Queen was walking into this world of men who were all much, much older than her. The British Empire had been changing its shape over the previous decades, and more and more countries were gaining their independence. Many of these countries wanted the freedom of being independent, whilst retaining some of the beneficial ties, including trading and foreign affairs. Elizabeth had dedicated her life at the tender age of 21, and by the late 1960s, most of the British territories became independent, but had joined the Commonwealth. Even through periods of political unease, the Commonwealth has continued to grow and become a remarkable force for change. This is a Royal Command performance. Children of Tasmania parade before their Queen, who too lives in a small island. Her thoughts are undoubtedly now with her own children. Having on so many occasions been welcomed to opening ceremonies around the Commonwealth, it is a pleasure this time to welcome you to my own home. Here at Buckingham Palace in 1949, my father met the heads of government when they ratified the London Declaration, which created the Commonwealth as we know it today. 2002 was an incredibly difficult year for Elizabeth. Her sister, Princess Margaret, died in King Edward VII's Hospital, London, at 6.30 a.m. on February the 9th, 2002, at age 71 one day after suffering a stroke that resulted in cardiac problems, and three days after the 50th anniversary of her father's death. On the 30th of March 2002, at 3.15 p.m., the Queen Mother died in her sleep at the Royal Lodge, Windsor Great Park, with Queen Elizabeth at her bedside. Ever since my beloved mother died over a week ago, 
I have been deeply moved by the outpouring of affection which has accompanied her death. My family and I always knew what she meant for the people of this country and the special place she occupied in the hearts of so many here, in the Commonwealth, and in other parts of the world. But the extent of the tribute that huge numbers of you have paid my mother in the last few days has been overwhelming. I have drawn great comfort from so many individual acts of kindness and respect. Over the years, I have met many people who have had to cope with family loss, sometimes in the most tragic of circumstances. So I count myself fortunate that my mother was blessed with a long and happy life. She had an infectious zest for living, and this remained with her until the very end. I know, too, that her faith was always a great strength to her. On the 9th of April, 2021, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, died aged 99. To Elizabeth, this came as a devastating loss. Prince Philip has walked two steps behind Queen Elizabeth ever since she became Queen in 1952 and has been the supporting man, husband and father that the royal family has needed him to be. Over the years, his personality has shone through in his charitable work and public appearances. It is almost impossible to imagine the great burden of responsibility that has been carried by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II throughout her life. But there is no doubt that the unbreakable bond and closeness that she shared with her husband and the love and support they have afforded one another has carried them together and made the tours of life that much more worthwhile. On the 8th of September, 2022, Buckingham Palace announced the Queen was under medical supervision. After hours of broadcasting and speculation in the news, the Prime Minister received the news. Good evening. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. Her reign lasted for 70 years, from post-war austerity and the end of empire through the expansion of the Commonwealth. On behalf of all my family, I can only offer the most sincere and heartfelt thanks for your condolences and support. They mean more to me than I can ever possibly express. When it was finally announced that the Queen had died, there was an extraordinary outpouring of grief amongst uh, the nation because, you know, the majority of, of, of the Queen's subjects had never known um, another monarch. It was kind of the end of an era. It wasn't just her death. It was the end of an era. It was end of the Elizabethan age as we know it. Buckingham Palace was her London home. Today, with military precision, Britain's longest serving monarch left the palace for the last time. The Queen's coffin, draped in the royal standard and with the imperial state crown on top, was taken slowly through the palace gates aboard a gun carriage. Behind walked the King, his sister and brothers, and behind them the Dukes of Cambridge and Sussex. 25 years ago, the two brothers had their childhood defined by the image of them walking behind their mother's coffin. Today, they honoured their grandmother in the same way. The nation bid farewell to Britain's longest reigning monarch. After a state funeral, she was laid to rest alongside her husband, Prince Philip, her parents, 
George VI and Elizabeth, and her beloved sister, Margaret. I think what has defined the Elizabethan era is it took us from the ravages of war to this extraordinary world in which we live in now. And, and so it actually defines the era of the greatest change the world has ever known. And yet, she managed to stay the same. I think that is the secret. So when the world was moving so fast and changing and we've gone from, you know, just having television to the, the most sophisticated technology that you could ever imagine. And that's just all in one person's lifetime. Elizabeth is a name that carries a legacy in itself as a consequence of being worn by two incredibly powerful monarchs who have deeply marked history. Both Elizabeth I and Elizabeth II have shown nothing but dedication to the country they ruled. By fulfilling their oath and ruling devotedly until their deaths.